Massachusetts. Uh -huh. uh, Juliana Garcia Mejia was admitted to our graduate program, uh, where she was tremendously excited to pursue a thesis in astronomical instrumentation. Um, she won a Ford Fellowship and an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, and during her time here saw many successes beyond the actual content of the thesis, which I will describe in a moment. Um, but while you were here, you were a Harvard Horizons scholar. Uh, and if you haven't seen her online talk, you really must do so. Um, but not just now. <laughs> um, and you also were a deeply valued teacher and taught in several courses, including Astronomy One, where I'm the professor and, um, uh, and, and uh, won a certificate uh, for distinction teaching in every time you taught. Um, before I describe the, the thesis work, I want to really acknowledge Juliana's contributions to outreach and to inclusion and to her service, uh, both to the CFA community and to, I would say, the broader young scientist community. Um, as they say in The Princess Bride, allow me to explain. <laughs> There's too much. <laughs> Let me sum up. <laughs> um, so. Um, Juliana locally, of course, was extremely involved in, I think, making the CFA a more vibrant and more inclusive place. And um, you were on the initial uh, DEI committee. Um, you were a grad student peer mentor. You instructed at the Banneker Institute, run by Professor Johnson. Um, and you were also an organizer of the uh, Equity and Inclusion Journal Club. But um, beyond that, I know that you're passionate about bringing astronomy to um, underserved young potential scientists in Central and South America. And Juliana has re retained that connection uh, with her, with uh, Colombia, where, where you grew up, um, uh, and um, uh, through the um, Clubes de Ciencias, which is a program for high school students, um, but also throughout the development of the Tierras project. And so the Tierras Observatory um, uh, has a YouTube channel, a bilingual YouTube channel, uh, as well as you operated a logo competition uh, for the youth in Columbia, which generated this logo, which will you explain? Yes. Okay. I'll explain. So I will not spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> Yellow butterflies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have read outside of astronomy. <laughs> okay, um, now, um, the, the, but what was, you know, so wonderful, Juliana, to work with you is that you are unstoppable. And, you know, doing a hardware project where you're not just helping with a 50 person effort, but you, you, you won funding, you did the initial design, you assembled the optics, you built the observatory, um, and are getting first science results. To actually pull that off during the timeline of a PhD in astronomy <coughs> these days is a very special and, and very hard thing to do. Um, and at this point, I really want to say what made that possible was the community um, of, um, of scientists and engineers at the CFA. I think that was very important. And so um, Dan and I co-advised Juliana on this thesis. Although I don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> you said I should do most of the time. <laughs> as well as a number um, of the engineering and, and, and support staff. And, and you know, what was um, amazing, of course, is I don't know if you heard, but there was this whole pandemic. And, you know, there was a moment where we were all sent home, and Juliana's hardware and optics were all sitting there in the lab, and she could not get to them. But she won special permission and was supported by, by uh, CFA scientists to really get in there and get working, um, you know, under the pretty severe restrictions. And even going to the observatory, 
um, during COVID was, was no easy thing. And so it's really remarkable that um, you were able to carry this all the way through from, from conception to actually some, some um, light curves, which I presume we'll see at some point. Okay. Um, uh, Juliana uh, has uh, had, had many interesting options for next year, but um, should today prove successful, uh, you will be a joint Papalardo and 51 Pegasi Fellow at MIT, which is great because you will get to see a new institutional culture. Um, you've been at Harvard a long time, but you won't be so far away, so we'll, we'll still be able to collaborate regularly as TRS really starts to produce more, more scientific results. Um, I also really want to acknowledge um, the presence of your family and friends who have joined you uh, on this very special occasion today. It's really wonderful. I know many of you have traveled from a long way, and, uh, uh, and it's really great that you're here. Um, and I also want to say a, a special thank you to Professor Gaspar Bacos, who is the external examiner visiting uh, from Princeton. Um, I hope you approve of the thesis. But we'll do it <laughs> okay. Um, at this point, uh, having taken up more than my allotted time, I'm going to hand things over to you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here. I, I love to see this room packed. Um, I, I'm going to leave the acknowledgments for the end, actually, uh, and the tears. I thought it was gonna be too late for my mom at this point, but she seems to be doing fine, so <laughs> let's keep it going. All right, so we have a lot of ground to cover. I'm gonna get right to it. So we're, I'm gonna start with a little motivation. Why did we spend all this time building an ultra-precise time series, time series photometer? Then I'm gonna walk you through what is it that makes Tierra special and different? This is the bulk of my thesis, covers chapters through to two through six. And then we're going to go into whether or not it actually works. I'm gonna convince you that it does. We're gonna talk about some interesting commissioning challenges that I experienced, and then uh, I'm gonna sh share some science, early science results with you. And where this story really begins is with the M-Dwarf opportunity. Um, I think, and I hope to convince you today, that one of the most exciting avenues for research both from a technical, demographic, and scientific perspective today is the M-Dwarf opportunity. And this is the idea that we can fast track the discovery of a habitable planet around the smallest stars in the galaxy. And what I mean by a habitable planet is a planet that is nearby, very nearby, I'm talking about within 15 parsecs of the sun, that is terrestrial size, there's a radius uh, smaller than 1.5 times the radius of the Earth, and that is in the habitable zone of its host star. Now let's talk about the stars for a second. The stars are M dwarf stars. These have um, temperatures below 4,000 Kelvin. And the ones I'm concerned with here have masses between 10 and 30% that of the sun. Um, and now, as I'm about to explain in a second, all of these characteristics together actually make it so that we can not just fast track the discovery of these planets, but also their atmosphere characterization. So what are the observational advantages offered by M dwarf stars. Well, first of all, they're everywhere. So, whereas, um, where, oh, sorry. Whereas um, a G, a G stars within 25 parsecs of the sun cover are only about 7.8% of the total, and F, G, and K stars make up 21% of the total, M dwarf stars cover 75% of uh, all of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. So they really are very, very abundant. Furthermore, at face value, these stars are small, so that means that if we're trying to find a, um, a transit and trying to measure the radius of a planet around a G-type star, um, we, uh, around an Earth, of an, of an Earth, Earth size, we need a, an instrument that can measure dips of 84 parts per million. But life gets a lot easier if we're trying to measure those, um, those dips around M-dwarf stars between 10 and 30% the mass of the sun, because then we're dealing with numbers between 930 parts per million and 8,400 parts per million, which is right now within, um, within what our state-of-the-art observatories can do. What is more, the low masses of M-dwarfs also allow us to detect, the, uh, to measure the masses of these terrestrial planets. In the case of a, an Earth-sized planet around a G-type star, the reflex motion due to the Earth is in the order of 0.18 meters per second, whereas in the case of M-dwarf stars, it's more in the order of 1.5 meters per second, which is more commensurate 
with what current observatories can do. So we're in a situation where we can measure the mass, we can measure the radius, we can measure the mass, get the density. And what's even more interesting is since these stars are less luminous, their habitable zones are way closer to the star. So in the case of a G-type star, of course, they're at one AU, but in the case of a habitable zone around an M-dwarf star, we're talking about habitable zones with periods between 2.5 and 15 days. So not only are these habitable zones closer, but it's also more likely that these planets will transit, the transits are deeper, they're way more likely, and they're going to happen more as a function of time. So it's more likely that we'll build the signal to noise to be able to not only discover them, but also characterize their atmospheres. Okay, so seems like we're all set. M doors are great, that's where we should go. The question that naturally follows is how many of these M dwarf stars with nearby, with, uh, with terrestrial planets in the vicinity of the sun, so within 15 parsecs, have we actually found? And it turns out that we've only found eight systems with these types of planets. And in fact, if Christo's around, he'll tell you, Christo just defended his PhD last week, and he'll tell you that I'm actually cheating because TRAPPIST-1 and L9859 actually have masses that are just a little higher than 30% and a little lower than 10% the mass of the sun. So in fact, depends on how you're counting, it can be anywhere between six and eight systems. So it seems like there's still a lot of room for observational work to actually increase the census of these terrestrial sized planets. And what's even more is that only two of these systems, LHS 1140 and TRAPPIST-1, have planets uh, in, within their habitable zones. So there really is still a lot of work to do um, to increase the census of these planets. And also to answer the question of why we haven't found them. Could it be that these planets are less common than we expect, th expect them to be? Could it be that the planets are hiding, lurking in the noise of the observatories that we're observing them with right now? There's a lot of questions open there. Now, another reason why I cheated and I decided to include TRAPPIST-1, although its mass, again, is a little bit lower than the... Um, than the masses that I'm dealing with here, between 10 and 30% the mass of the sun, is because TRAPPIST is, to my knowledge, the only one that has been observed with JWST. Um, I think he is Green et al. 20, 2023 actually posted some results of, um, of the first or some of the first observations done with JWST through the MIRI instrument. They actually observed TRAPPIST-1b, um, they observed, I think, something like five secondary eclipses, and their observations are most consistent with no atmosphere. So, what this means is not only that this plant, that is not only that this, uh, this star, these systems are rare, but also, perhaps, that the systems might not be super amenable to, sustain, to uh, planets that sustain atmospheres. And what this is hinting at, where I'm trying to get at with this, is that perhaps part of the challenge here, part of the challenge the, um, that we really need to delve deeper into, is that M dwarf stars may or may not be great hosts for habitability. Because this entire picture that I have been presenting so far rests on the, assumptions that, uh, the assumption that M dwarf stars are great are hosts for life. But the reality is that we know relatively little about these stars. We don't know much, we, we have begun, be, begun building the picture of how their stellar magnetic activity relates to their angular momentum histories and their radiation environments, their chromospheric activity, but there's still really a lot to learn. And in large part as a result of this idea that we fast track the discovery of habitable planet around these stars, a lot of interest in the community has grown regarding the nature of the stars themselves, but also the radiation environments to which their attendant planets are subjected. And one example of the types of research that are being done with M dwarfs is actually led here by Jen Winter Winters while well, she was a postdoc between 2016 and 2021. Jen led an all-sky multi-epoch um, uh, spectroscopy survey of stars in a volume-complete sample. You can see the location of the stars here in RA and DEC all throughout the sky. And what, um, what Jen did was obtain spectra for 413 stars out of the 512 stars in that volume-complete sample. And a lot of interesting research has come out of, um, of uh, Jen's work, way more than I have time to cover. 
But one of my uh, favorite results is that of Amber Medina's thesis work. Amber actually graduated um, back uh, a few years ago from the, pro from the program as well. She's a great friend of mine. And what Amber found, what Amber decided to do, she combined the data from, um, from Jen Winter's sample with rotation periods from TEF, from the space-based mission tests, and uh, the ground-based mission, the ground-based observatory MIRTH, and she calculated the rotation period, which I'm plotting, which she's plotting here in the x-axis, and she also calculated uh, the flare rates. So here it's a, it's plotted as a log of r. So you can think about it as the amount of uh, flares per day over a certain energy threshold. And what Amber found was that stars clustered into two groups. So on the group up here on the right, we have stars in a saturated regime where they flare a lot, their chromospheric activity is it's quite high, um, uh, they are in there rotating rapidly. And then there is another group here where stars have wider ranges of flare rates, they, um, they are not as active, and they're rotating much more slowly. What's even more interesting about Amber's work is that she actually did a lot of work to calculate the ages of all, the, all of these stars. And what she found is that there's an average age at which stars from this cluster up here, the saturated cluster, switch to uh, or move over to the unsaturated regime. And that happens at two and a half billion years. What this means is that by the time these stars transition from the saturated to the unsaturated regimes, if these stars have planets, which by the way, the stars in red here do, these planets will have been subjected to extremely high radiation, extremely active radiation environments. And, that, and this is, by the way, about four times as long as the Earth was subjected to a very active Earth, uh, as the Earth was subjected to a very active sun. So this is enough time for the atmospheres of the attendant planets of these M-dwarf stars to be completely stripped of atmospheres. So are M-dwarfs uh, good, ho good hosts for life? Are they not? I think the jury's still out there. But the bottom line is that while Amber did a fantastic job with the samples, she could only calculate their rotation periods, so she could only do this work for about 50% of those stars. We still need to complete the picture. We need to measure the rotation periods for about 50% more of those stars. And for that, we need an observatory that pushes the state of the art um, and achieves higher photometric precision. And there are additional, cha additional challenges associated with the M-dwarf opportunity, but there's also additional gains. So if we go back here to the plot of all the systems we've known, uh, we know um, with these terrestrial-sized planets, it's also really cool to think that only three of them host um, planets with radii below one Earth radius. So not only do we, uh, do we not have a lot of uh, planets that are within the habitable zones of these stars, we also don't have a lot of planets that are true analogs of the solar system. That means we don't know much about the occurrence rates of these planets, uh, of planets that are true analogs of Mars, Mercury, and Venus in the solar system. And by extension, that means we still don't know what it is that makes a planet become habitable like the Earth versus what it is that makes a planet become non -ha not habitable like Venus. And really increasing the census would be fantastic in terms of completing this picture. Now, what's the observational challenge like? So we go back to this figure. I'm showing the transit for the Earth-sized planets. If we wanted to find uh, M plan a planet as small as Mars around, an M around a G-type star, the challenge is even bigger. We're talking about a signal that's about the third of that. Um, State-of-the-art space-based photometers, uh, could such as Kepler, could achieve this, but that one's decommissioned, as we know. But in the case of M-dwarf stars, the challenge becomes bigger, but it's still very much possible if we're just willing to push the state-of-the-art of photometric precision a little bit. So that's what we're doing here. And while we're in the subject of pushing the photometric precision to find the M-dwarf stars, a question that in comes up for somebody like me is, what else is there out there that is just a little bit smaller that we could try to find? Where are the moons? So if we, uh, if we then include, uh, for example, a Ganymede-sized moon in the, in the plot, now of course I've kind of gotten rid of the G-type stars and we're only focusing on the red-type stars, 
you'll see that the depth of the transit of a Ganymede-sized moon is between 159 and 430 parts per million. So again, very challenging, but definitely doable if we push the state of the art. And of course, uh, if you guys are curious, this is what an Earth-Moon transit would look like. So we're talking now about uh, depth of 69 to 620 parts per million. Um, as I'm about to describe in a second, this is probably only possible from the ground uh, for the smallest of these stars. But hey, still, still very much within the doable realm. So why bother with the moons? So I've talked about, I've talked about um, habitable, habitable planets, increasing the senses, really completing the picture of planet formation. But why would we even bother to increase the, photo, the, to, uh, increase the photometric precision to find moons? Well, moons have actually been really important within our solar system to complete the picture of how the solar system came to be. In fact, the Earth's moon um, stabilizes its obliquity, uh, so uh, how its axis changes as a function of time, and by extension, its climate. And a lot of scientists actually believe that because of this stabilization, long-term stabilization of its climate, the moon actually also plays a huge role, not only in, um, in allowing for life to emerge on Earth, but for sustaining life on Earth. The tides, tides are also uh, something that comes up with the Earth-Moon system. Beyond the Earth-Moon system, the moons in the outer solar system uh, have been known to play a significant um, role in informing the late-stage growth of gas giant planets. I really like these three papers. I'm just going to throw some ideas here. So, for example, Canop and Ward um, they actually took a look at the composition of the Galilean satellites. Uh, so, as they, as they, um, as they uh, move away from Jupiter, and, they've, and they use that to constrain the temperature distribution of the disk from which Jupiter formed. So like the proto-planetary disk of the planet. I don't know what the term is for that. And then in the case of uh, Morbidelli et al. 2012, what, they actually, what, they actually, what Morbidelli et al. actually argues is that because the Uranian moon system is tilted with respect to the solar system, it, this is actually indicative of the fact that the, the moons must have been um, part of a large-scale collision because that's the only way that you could have tilted the system in such a way. And actually, this combination, combination of... Um, of studies such as this are the ways in which we've been able to piece together the history of bombardment of the solar system, the planet-planet interactions, and ultimately why it is that the Earth is habitable, is habitable and why we're here. But of course, I am not saying that we're going to have access to this level of detail um, uh, in our in um, uh, in our studies of moons. We're really talking about about detecting them here. Two ways in which I think that moons could become, in, could become um, useful immediately uh, are, first of all, actually helping us um, constrain, uh, provide an independent constraint of the density of the host. It turns out that moons, uh, you can exploit Kepler's law kind of in the same way that, that it is exploited to obtain the stellar density of, um, of a star planet system. You can exploit it to obtain the density of a planet independently. And then the other thing that you can do is we can use, do is use the demographics of exomoons in a similar, in a way similar to the solar system to actually, um, to actually figure out piece, uh, figure out a, a planet, a comprehensive planet formation theory. But up to, to date, we've only really found two moons, uh, well, two moon candidates. I didn't say moons, but they're nothing like the moons we found we have in the solar system. They're actually the signs of Neptune, so they're gigantic. And then in, in terms of rings, uh, we've actually only, we only have a candidate for rings, this Ben Jaffel and Ballester paper. Okay, so I've talked about habitable planets, I've talked about solar system analogs, I've talked about moons. What instruments are out there that are de dedicated to doing all of this work? Um, let me tell you about the state-of-the-art instruments, and then let me tell you about why I don't think that they're dedicated to this type of work. So first we have TESS. TESS has a 10 centimeter aperture. They're doing an all sky survey. I think a lot of us have heard about it. But the thing with TESS is that because it has such a small aperture, by the time that you're observing M dwarfs, the light curves are uh, photon noise limited. So the photometric precision that you're actually getting for the, from the light curves is something like a thousand parts per million. Again, a lot of the phenomena that I showed you is, is in, gets really interesting. A lot of the discovery space happens below a thousand parts per million. 
There's also Kiops, which is re relatively recently launched mission. It's kind of in the same vein. It has a 35 centimeter aperture. Um, it's also somewhat photo photon noise limited, although they do do better with the M dwarfs. The problem is that it is the data is completely proprietary, and uh, about 80 percent of the about 80 percent of the data is um, is um, and, and targets are selected by the GTO, their GTO program, and the community does not yet have access to it. Now, these are space-based missions. From the ground, there was MIRTH, and MIRTH was actually decommissioned about a year ago, but they were able to reach something like 1,000 parts per million precision within a night, but night to night, so as they observed the same target night, and then, uh, and then the night after, and then the night after, and compared the observations, they were getting something like 3,000 parts per million. And then Speculus, which is the, uh, which is, uh, its precursor was TRAPPIST, the, the, um, the observatory that discovered the famous TRAPPIST-1 system. TRAPPIST actually has a one meter aperture, they have higher, uh, they have higher precision, and, um, but they still are reaching something like 1,000 parts per million within a night, and 3,000 parts per million night to night. So why is it that two observatories that are so different, Mirth and Speculus, um, very different, very different uh, targets, very different designs, how is it that they're getting stuck at the same noise limits? Well, the answer, I think, is in the water. So over here, what I'm showing you is a plot of wavelength uh, and transmission. It's, uh, it's normalized. It's, it really doesn't uh, matter too much here. And then uh, what I'm plotting is an M dwarf, a, a spectrum of an M dwarf star, something at 2800 Kelvin, and then a G type star with a 5800 Kelvin spectrum. Now, when you do photometry, what you're basically doing is very low resolution spectroscopy. We observe through, one observes through the slow I and slow C filters. And in fact, Mirth and Speculus observe through a slow I plus slow C filter. The idea being that they're trying to get as many photons as they can out of these M dwarf stars. But what happens? What happens is that as a function of time overnight and then night after night, the amount of water in the atmosphere is varying a lot. And the amount of water in the atmosphere in a, in a place like Chile on Hawaii or Hawaii can change between something for some, uh, um, between one and 30 millimeters per night. And uh, a, uh, the Sloan, there's a paper, Baker et al. 2017, where uh, um, they actually quantified the change, in, uh, the change in photometric precision as a function of change in precipital water vapor, and they found that a change of one millimeter, so just going, for example, from set 30, 11, 9 to 10, 10 to 11, is enough to induce a 2,000 part per million um, error in the light curves. So this really is the dominant effect if you're observing through all of these, uh, if you're observing through a filter that's as wide as this. So, what is one to do? <laughs> All right. I'm going to leave you thinking about that one. All right. What if we had, so what if we had an observatory that would, was completely dedicated to all of these science? By the way, none of these observatories that I've told you about are dedicated to these three science cases that I've told you about. Really discovering the smaller solar system planets, the habitable zone planets, what if we had a system that could, uh, a telescope that could measure the unknown rotation periods in this volume complete sample, help us really understand there's M dwarf stars in the radiation environments? What if we had a telescope that could help us at least search or place some sort of occurrence rates on the exosatellites? Well, enter tierras. This is what I've been doing for the past six years of my uh, life. Um, this is an ultra-precise ground-based time series of observatory. It's located in Mount Hopkins, Arizona. And as many of you know, Tierras actually um, repurposes an old telescope, the Tumas North Telescope, which scanned the sky in the infrared JHA in K-bands between 1997 and 2001. And then, um, and then it was actually mothballed for something like 10 years, and nobody had used it for a very long time. There's a project called Paratel that used it for a few years, but using the exact same camera as Tumas had used, which is an infrared camera. Uh, but by the time we took it over, it really had been mothballed for a very long time. And the challenge was, in order to be able to do all of this, uh, to do all of this science, the challenge was to design an observatory that could reach a photometric precision of something like 250 parts per million on a time scale of both 10 minutes, so within a night, but also night after night after night. 
So let's go back to what it is technically that is going to allow us to do, uh, to reach these photometric precision. This really is, again, chapters two and six of my thesis. So you can, um, we can kind of uh, summarize what allows the telescope to do this in, a, in an instrument. The instrument, there's an instrument that sits right underneath the primary mirror of the telescope. I'm changing the And it consists of three, feet, of three specific features that I'm gonna tell you about really quickly. The first one is the filter. And the filter is going to minimize the precipital water vapor error contribution to the total photometric error by avoiding the water altogether. So Mirth, actually, Mirth and Speculos have actually tried um, using, well, Mirth hasn't, do, hasn't done this, but Speculos has actually tried using an external radiometer to, to measure the water and actually remove it from the data. We decided to do away with all of that and just actually see what would happen if we avoid the water altogether. So here we have, again, the water spectrum. And my challenge for this part of the, uh, the thesis was, how can I design a filter that avoids water altogether, but it's wide enough that the photon noise is not going to totally kill us, and we're going to be able to keep that photometric budget, um, photometric budget um, below, below what we need to be able to measure, those, find those really, really tiny signals in the data. So this is how I did this. So I basically did a 2D, uh, I started with a 2D simulation. So what I have here is a plot of center wavelength as a function of bandwidth. And every single pixel in the data, in the plot, is showing you the amount of precipitable water vapor error through the Tierra system, assuming that we are observing an M3 star and comparing it to a G-type star. And what you can see here, oh, and then the color code is the amount of precipitable water vapor error. So redder areas have really low precipitable water vapor error. That's where we're gonna, that's where we wanna go. And black is the no-no areas. Again, we're trying to go for something like 250 parts per million. So gray is kind of the highest, but we really wanna keep it as low as possible. But you can, what you can see immediately with the M3.5 star is that there's a region of parameter space that is clearly superior to the other. So it's that red region over there. Now the problem is that precipitable water vapor and the way that it affects M dwarf stars is highly dependent on spectral type. So if I repeated, when I repeated this exercise for the M7 star, you can see that exactly in the region where I was doing great with the M3 star, I was doing extremely poorly. With, uh, with the M7 star. And another challenge that is perhaps not as immediately clear, but as I spent a lot of time looking at these plots, I realized was that I was gonna have to figure out not just a way to, um, to um, characterize the filter in terms of a center wavelength and a bandwidth, but I was also going to have to include into this two D simulations all of the parameters that actually uh, a fabricator for a filter has to include because of course the manufacturer cannot design a perfect top hat filter. That simply doesn't exist. Ultimately, a lot of work, what I discovered, was that the single most important specification for the filter was to maintain attenuation levels below 0.01% outside of 80, 834 nanometers, so outside of this, uh, uh, to the left of this region, and, and outside of 893 nanometers, while maximizing transmission in this region of, um, of wavelength space. And you can see just by eye um, that it makes sense because there's not a lot of water features in this region. This is what the, fi what the filter actually looks like. Um, you can see the as built in green, the um, in, in dark green and the um, and in, in light green you can see the for fabrication model. All right, then I'm just gonna zoom into this region to show you what the filter looks like. Uh, if you zoom in, the fabricators did a fantastic job. We actually broke the record for the amount of layers in the interference coding used. You can ask me all about that if you're interested, but the slopes of this filter are remarkable. It looks like a filter you would find in a textbook. And then I'm here, I'm plotting it in log space because I really want to show you that they nailed the, the, um, the fabricators also really nailed it with getting the transmission down to below 0.01% by the time we reach these wavelengths. Actually, the noise you see is because of the high res spectrograph they're using was um, not getting enough photons. So that's where the noise is coming from. All right, let's keep going. So, then after the filter, we have set of, a set of coded optics. And the coded optics increase the field of view of the telescope from a 0.19 degrees to 0.5 degrees. 
So why would we want to increase the telescope to have a larger field of view? Well, we need more comparison stars. Because if you have more comparison stars, you can better calibrate your uh, photometry. This is actually all motivated by the work of Nutzman and Charbonneau, who in 2008, while designing the Mirth spectrograph, curated a sample of approximately 3,000 K and M dwarfs and then, within 33 parsecs. And then they asked the question, for each of those M dwarf targets, what, um, they, they, what is the size of field of view required in order for that field of view to include 10 times as much flux from those calibrators as the target? And the results are summarized in this plot. So over here, I'm plotting field, uh, they're plotting field of view as a function of cumulative fraction within the sample of 3,300 uh, K and M dwarfs. And what they find is that basically by the time you get to a, to a, field, of view, a field of view with a side of 30 arc minutes, you've gained most of the, most of the cumulative fraction of uh, M dwarf stars in the, in, the, in the sample. So you're really maximizing your ability to do high, um, high uh, to obtain a lot of comparison stars in the field if you have a field of view of 30 uh, arc minutes. And here you can see that the differences in the lines correspond to whether you're observing in an I filter, an I plus C filter, or an I plus C filter where you're only, um, where you're only um, uh, using stars with radii below 33% that of the sun. In the case of tierras, um, we would be somewhere in we would be somewhere in between these two lines. All right. So how did we actually go about doing that? So what we did is we uh, built a four element focal reducer and field flattener. So these are actually four optics. I'm showing them here as a in cross section. And um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plot the spots. So these are what the star images look like across the system. And what you can see is um, that as I, as I move away from the axis of the telescope, the chromatic aberration in the system uh, actually gets worse and worse, which makes a lot of sense. That's very, that, is, that makes a lot of sense because we're adding a lot of power here. But because, again, we're using such a narrow filter, we can get away with this and keep the spots below the, see, the average seeing of Arizona, which is something like 1.17 arc seconds. Um, and we can actually use this trick to image, uh, to increase the field of view of the telescope to a half degree. And, fi and finally, we employ a high near-infrared quantum efficiency CCD that maximizes M dwarf photon collection. So this is in contrast to, for example, a uh, typical back illuminated MIRTH CCD, where you can see here uh, in this plot of quantum efficiency as a function of wavelength, the MIRTH CCD, which is representative of typical back illuminated CCDs, would uh, have a quantum efficiency of something like 50% in our Tierra's band pass, whereas in our case, uh, the teal line is a representative model of our CCD. We're getting something like 90% efficiency. Um, by the way, the um, the little diamonds are actually measurements of what our CCD behaves like. One other very interesting feature of our CCD, which you can see here right before um, it was, in, it was um, in, installed into the door, is that two parts of it, the outer parts of it, are actually uh, blocked. And this is because we use the, the CCD in a mode that's called frame transfer. What that means is that we use those outer regions of the telescope for um, reading out the chip and that results in faster readout times, um, and by extension means we can spend more time on sky. And we spent a lot of time in the lab actually uh, testing this, uh, and this was, um, this was a lot of fun. This was work that I did with uh, Peter Doherty and learned a lot in the process. This is what the doer looks like uh, once uh, we installed it at the, what, so we installed it inside on the test bench in the telescope. All right, and then there's another trick under a sleeve beyond the hardware that's actually more software related, which is that Tierras is actually a fully robotic observatory, and it is installed uh, on a telescope that, we re that I refurbished for this purpose. And also the telescope is 100% dedicated for our goals. So what I wanna do now is show you a few pictures of what I received the telescope looking like versus what um, the telescope looks like right now. So we're going to do some a la HGTV before and after pictures. <laughs> so this is what the telescope looked like. It really was kind of the, um, uh, the, um, 
storage unit of the rest of the mountain. It had not been used for a very long time. And after a lot of work I did in collaboration with the flow staff, you can see how much better things got. This is the control room. These are all the leftover pieces of hardware uh, from the old Tumas project. Um, lots of lots and lots of computers to get rid of and then we completely revamped the area and then this is my absolute favorite one this is the this is the primary mirror i received um and then in case you're wondering what the little pieces of black thing are i want to let you know that we have evicted all the mice <laughs> we evicted all the mice and then these oh this is what the mirror looks like now. So lots of work actually have gone into improving the facility as well. And then right before the pandemic, I got really lucky with this one that I was able to get it done before. Right before the pandemic, uh, I actually was able to collaborate with a few contractors to carry out a full telescope refurbishment process where we actually changed the motor, the RA and deck motors of the telescope, the whole electrical system of the telescope, the telescope control software, um, the RA and deck tapes, to improve the quality of the pointing of the telescope. And these and many other details of everything that it entailed can be found in uh, my SPIE paper, uh, <laughs> so which uh, you can read at your own leisure. Okay, so after all of these work, doing all of these instrumentation, I promised that I would spend some time talking about whether or not it works. Um, so does it work? So this is, uh, this is when things get interesting. So I'm going to talk about chapter seven, assembly and commissioning. Um, and people know that I love GoPro videos. I record it every single day in the lab. Joe can attest to this. Uh, so you're going to see what my days in the lab looked like. So this is what, uh, the, uh, what building the instrument looked like. So we are here preparing the, one of the uh, lenses for installation. We're, install we're actually attaching it to its bezel, this aluminum thing, with liquid rubber. It's called RTV. And then here you can see, um, you can see me actually cleaning the, one, of the, one of the lenses and adding it to the stack. This is lens number two. And then you're about to see me clean yet another lens in the lab and add it to the stack. This is, of course, after we had bonded every single one of these um, lenses. Uh, Joe and I were talking about this before. We're the only two people in, this, in the entire CFA that know how to run the machine that does this, so he's really sad that I'm leaving, but I'm gonna be at MIT, Joe. Don't you worry. And then after this, um, we actually proceeded to install the filter. Actually, let me return this. Let me see if I can do that. Uh, let's do it. Let's play it again. I just want to show you. It's totally talk through. All right. Well, I just want to um, emphasize the filter here for a second. Let me see if I can do this. There you go. Oh, there you are. Okay, so after we had cleaned, um, this is lens number one. This is interesting. So then we actually are, you can see us here mounting the filter. So this is the filter and you can see we're not actually using this liquid rubber. We used an entirely different design. This is a lot of work to, to get that filter into its bezel safely. It's a three point mount. Then you can see the filter, uh, the filter we're installing it onto that, onto that whole stack. And finally, after installing the filter into that whole stack, um, I'm uh, uh, getting it all ready to be sent to the mountain. Here you can see me inst uh, packing everything up, sending it to the mountain, and then we proceed to do a very detailed installation effort, um, actually building this, whole, building this whole installation fixture, which was completely custom made for the, for the instrument as well. It took a very long time. You can see how we use it there to install the door then the optics, and then finally bring the whole instrument, to get, instrument up to the telescope. Uh, and of course, you can see us, we're so happy, you can see us smiling through the masks. <laughs> um, but we knew the joy was limited because there are a lot of unknowns about the collimation quality of the telescope. And you can see it here immediately in the first engineering light of the telescope. I want to make sure I'm not in the... So Dave loves to joke, I love to say this thing, but I love to say this, but please just laugh. I know you've heard this many times, but Dave loves to say that the first light image looks like the butterflies 
in the logo of the observatory, which, by the way, are a reference to the butterflies in Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. Um, that is a logo designed by a Colombian student. And, um, but I mean, I, I thought it was funny, but I still wasn't thrilled. Um, <laughs> and so I got to work and actually tried, or got to figuring out what was going on. So usually uh, this is what you want. So you want a telescope where, a prime, where you have a primary mirror, an optical axis, and a perfectly aligned secondary mirror. And actually, when you take a picture of a star and you defo a defocused picture of a star, it looks something like that, where the secondary, um, secondary shadow is perfectly aligned with, uh, with, the, uh, with the primary star. All of the energy is, uh, is well balanced across the entire uh, circumference. What I actually had when I took a picture is this. I had a system that was severely, that had a lot of coma and had a lot of field-dependent astigmatism. And the reason why I know this is a lot of energy concentration in one, one of the sides of the, um, of the uh, uh, spot, and also the ellipticity of the spot changed depending on where I was with respect to the best focus position. And what that means is that the optical axis of mirror one and mirror two were completely, um, were completely um, misaligned. So I spent a lot of time designing and building a laser uh, alignment system. And that laser alignment system looks something like this. And what it allowed us to do, what it allows us to do is to find the optical axis of the mirror, mirror and then align the secondary to it. Um, so we use the laser, so I use a laser beam, uh, use and use that laser beam to align the secondary axis of the telescope of the, the secondary um, the optical axis of the primary to the optical axis of the secondary. Now the problem is that this helps us get away with uh, uh, solving the decentration issue between the, the, telescope, the primary and the secondary doesn't help us solve the tilt problem. But in any case, we proceeded because um, we had a plan under our sleeve. So here I am once again removing the instrument that we had just installed, um, installing this whole laser alignment fixture. And after installing the whole laser alignment fixture, I went ahead and aligned the whole telescope um, I aligned the instrument, the laser to the instrument, and then you're about to see me in a second installing the centering jig. The centering jig allows us to install, to align the laser to the, um, to the uh, primary mirror, and then we're about to tilt the primary mirror, uh, the, to tilt the whole telescope, and by tilting the telescope, we can shoot the laser to the secondary, and then you can see me there moving the secondary to align it to the telescope. So now we have a secondary and a primary that are at least centered with respect to each other. And this is what the spots looked like. Not great, not great. But actually, this was, a good, this was good news because when I compare them to my CMAX model, I realized that this, is, this, is, um, this was completely consistent with only a, sec a secondary that was only tilted. So then I went ahead and we uh, reinstalled the instrument and spent some time figuring out uh, what, how I was gonna correct the tilt finally corrected the tilt, and then got a second engineering light in there. Oh my god! That, that, that 2000 was the right guess. <laughs> so this is a second engineering light image. I'm not showing the defocus, but I just do want to point out that the stars are so round, regardless of what you're looking at in the field, and that is genuinely my excitement when uh, we got that uh, second engineering light image. All right, but the next problem was, of course, that the, we had huge amounts of sky background. Um, this makes a lot of sense. Tumas was an infrared telescope. It had a lot of background. It, they had, it had a lot of, um, it was exposed because all of the baffling, so all of the uh, instrumentation that removed the, back, the sky background noise was actually interior to their cryogenic system. You can see the old Tumas uh, North, Tumas uh, instrument over there. We had removed that. So we had a telescope that was unbaffled. So then Joe and I uh, spent a lot of time in the lab after I had designed this. So this is my pandemic activity. I actually designed this whole baffle system and then it was time to implement it after, uh, after the pandemic. Uh, you can see us here actually assembling the whole thing uh, in the lab. Then I just teleported myself to the mountain and, um, and then, of course, the baffles would be great if they floated, but they do not float. Uh, there's actually a lot of instrumentation that has to go in to also build an interface system for those baffles. And this is what you're seeing me um, assembling here. That took a lot of, a lot of days and a lot of work um, and because each of these systems actually also has in 
added to a uh, mechanical part, it's also an electrical part attached to software. Um, and then finally, you can see here, I'm spending a lot of time uh, assembling this whole interface structure. Then with the help of Tom and Pascal at the mountain, we're actually going installing the baffles. And then after installing the lower primary baffle, uh, you're gonna see us in a second tilting the telescope, installing the upper baffle. And then after installing the upper baffle, we reused that laser system that we had just, just used um, to align those baffles also to the optical axis of the telescope. And finally, be able to get science out of the telescope. So yes, that took a lot of work. But I do want to show you the improvement in sky background levels. So over here, you can see uh, observations of the sky. So this is electrons per, um, per pixel as a function of time. This is what we were getting before. This is like 13, 11,000 to 14,000 counts per, um, per electron per, um, per pixel per bin. So this is a one minute bin. So that's a lot of sky, in, even if it's full moon conditions. But I mean, you, there's no way we we're doing astronomy with this because what this means is that we're getting about 1% of the light that we're getting into the CCD is actually from the target. The rest was all sky background. And then after we'd installed the baffles, I mean, things improved by orders of magnitude. Now we're in full moon conditions. We're getting something that we can actually work with. All right, so let me finish off with some early science results. I'm really happy to, excited to show you this. So um, the first thing we did is actually spend a lot of time looking at, um, at TOI. So these are test targets of interest. And this one is TOI 2013, it's an M4B star. It's about 16 parsecs away. And this star, um, by the time when we started observing it, uh, it had a, a very interesting signal. It, wasn't in the, it was only in the RVs. It, it wasn't showing up in the, um, in the transit light curve, so we thought it was interesting. It was also interesting from the perspective of actually just figuring out what photometric precision we could get with the telescope. Um, what you're seeing here are three out of 19 nights. We were trying to figure out what were the, photo, the nights with photometric quality um, uh, weather. And then when, you, when, you, when we plot these photometric nights, so we plot RMS error as a function of bin size, you can see that by the time we bin the data to 12 minutes, we're actually reaching our goal of 250 parts per million. We are, what this means is that we are outperforming TESS, makes a lot of sense. TESS, again, has, um, has smaller apertures. This is great. This is, this is good news. This from the get-go get told us that we were, on, we were um, on our way. These are light curves that, you know, like I've, I've, where I've extracted photometry, but we still have not the best out of these data by any means. And then we also wanted to get a sense of what a, an Earth-sized planet signal would look like through this data. And you can see here, this is something like a thousand part, parts per million um, signal of an Earth-sized planet. And we didn't, we didn't discover it by any means, but I recover it so easily with just one transit, whereas tests, for tests, it took something like seven transits to build up the signal to actually discover it. And then another uh, piece of uh, work that I've, been, that I've been doing in collaboration with the wonderful grad student Emily Pass is actually measuring uh, known and unknown rotation periods to uh, figure out whether what the night-to-night -night precision, photometric precision of the telescope is. So the first one I started with is a known M7 star. This one's 10.5 parsecs away. You can see here in um, gray, you can see, well, we're, I'm plotting phase as a function of uh, flux. The points in gray are the actual unbin data. The points in green are the 20 minute bins. And the, um, the model in red is a, is a Hartman et al. spot model. These are harmonics. We're not plotting what's, act I don't, by saying n equals three, I don't mean there's three spots. I just mean this is a harmonic series uh, with a degree of three. Uh, but what you can see is that we're actually recovering, uh, we're actually recovering um, the period of that, of that star quite clearly as 0.117 days. But what's even more exciting is that when we take the, uh, when we calculate the night to night photometric precision, we're getting something like 720 parts per million in 20 minute bins. Not yet at the 250 parts per million precision, but super, we're, we really, really are getting there. And this is, a, this is a huge considering that what we're working with is 3000 parts per million uh, with state of the art observatories. All right. We have some other known stars, but I really am excited to show you this. This is LEP 1805. This is an M5.5 star, nine and a half parsecs away. It did not, it did not have a known rotation period um, because TESS actually didn't observe it. 
So with this, we are in, with this star, we are in a position where we can actually not just find the uh, the trend, the um, rotation period of the star, but we can also actually find new planets in the system. And with only something like 15 days of data on it, uh, we have a very interesting, um, a very interesting um, uh, candidate for a rotation period for this star of something like 0.8 days. You can see it clearly shows up in the LOMS cargo, but it's not present in the window function. Uh, always a good sign. All right, and I have one more. Let's probably skip. This is what all the data looks like, but I'll probably skip to the punchline and say this is another one that uh, that I've been observing. And this one looks a little bit uh, is a little bit trickier to say whether we've recovered the period. What's interesting is that I'm actually seeing on two not two weeks of data that I've actually haven't added to this plot. Uh, so I probably already have it. I just don't know that I have it. But if you look in the periodogram, it looks something like it's a 1.058, uh, 0 1.05 days, and it has a window, and uh, it's quite close to the one day alias, but that still doesn't necessarily mean that it is an alias, this is completely physical period. There's a lot we're going to do in the next few years, both from the perspective of rotation periods and the perspective of, M of um, terrestrial planets, uh, habitable planets and actually finding those uh, small uh, solar system analogs. And these are just some of the things uh, that we're thinking about, follow-up of TOIs, uh, uh, finding additional transits, measuring the stellar rotation periods in that volume complete sample that haven't been measured. There's a lot of science to do um, and uh, I, I hope I have built an exciting observatory that I can keep using for many years and that um, many students and postdocs can participate of. All right, that's a wrap for me. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna take two minutes to thank a few people, uh, and then I'll open it up for a few questions, if we can take some questions. Yes, yeah, so we started late. So okay, okay, awesome. Um, and, uh, all right. So first of all, I want to thank my advisor, Dave. You've been okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> no, seriously, if I could, um, summarize my relationship with Dave in one picture, it would probably be this one. <laughs> <laughs> Me just being completely crazy and like, let's do this, let's do that, and him being like, okay. Uh, no, no, seriously, Dave, you know what I think about you. Uh, I think you, deciding to work with you for my PhD has been just the best decision I could have made. I don't know what you saw in me to give me the trust to take on this incredibly difficult project, uh, but thank you for trusting me. I've had the time of my life, and I hope I made you proud. We'll see at 4 p.m. <laughs> We've had lots of adventures. He's a very serious advisor, um, um, but it's been, it's been a really fun time. And I also have been super blessed that I've been doing, I've done a project that I really, I do think I could not have done in any other place in the world. Like the CFA is particularly special in that I was advised by the best scientists in the world, but I was also advised by the best instrumentalists and engineers in the world. Uh, so Dan, thank you so much for sitting next, <laughs> sitting next to me <laughs> uh, and working through, working through every single aspect of the telescope. Every single, every single part that you've seen of the project w involved a conversation with, where Dan sat me down and really told, taught me about, okay, how are we going to do this analysis? How are we going to do this analysis? I, I really could, now I feel like I could write a book about what it takes to build an instrument and it's all because of you. So thank you so much, Dan. And I think that there's many ways that a project can be done, but the best way to do a project is if you're having fun. 
and I had the best time <laughs> with Bob and Joe in the lab. <laughs> so these are Bob and Joe, these are two uh, 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 SAO engineers, and this was us the whole time in the lab. Them telling them, uh, guiding me, guiding me through what to do, me guiding them through what to do. It's funny, I was like, I, was, I felt like a boss, although I was way younger than them and had way less clue about what was going on. Um, but this is Joe right here. You ha probably saw him in a lot of the GoPro pictures. And this is Bob. And we just had the best time working together. Thank you so, so much um, to you, Bob. Thank you also to all of my collaborators. I really could not have done this without you. Brian McLeod, I think you're here somewhere. Uh, you, were, you were the person who taught me how to call me the telescope. That was, I really thought I was going to drop the towel there. I remember calling my mom crying from the mountain. Just being like, Mom, I don't know if I can pull this off, but you really helped me, helped me through it. Thank you so, so much. Um, uh, thank you so much also to Peter for teaching me more than I ever thought I would know about CCDs. And I'm sure I still have lots and lots to learn. Thank you for your patience um, throughout all of it. And also thank you to the old, second person that I sent the most emails to after, Dave, Christine. <laughs> In order to pull off a project like this in the amount of time that we did, you need somebody who's willing to send orders out and work with providers and bust their butts to get things going. And that was Christine. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And again, on the subject of fun, when I was in Arizona, I got to tell you guys, I had the best time. This is just a demonstration of it. So this is on my birthday. And a, <laughs> the whole staff in the mountain surprised me with birthday hats for my birthday. These are all of them, even the ones that aren't represented him here. Thank you so much. I know you guys are watching. Thank you so much. I send you a big hug. Thank you for everything. I've had the best time working with all of you. To the grad students, the ones that are here and the ones that aren't, Thank you for being willing to try all of the coffee and Colombian candy that I wanted to feed you guys with. This is us drinking Colombian coffee in the grad lounge. And most recently, I fed them obleas um, at, the, at, a dinner part, at a dinner party that we had. Thank you to my mom. You know, I always tell the story about how I had an uncle who inspired me to pursue astronomy. So I, so I see him as the person who was like, holding my, to like teaching me to look up, but my mom really is a person to, who holds my head up when I really feel like I can't keep going. So thank you, mommy, from the beginning for, um, for all you've done for me. I love you. <laughs> to my partner in crime, <laughs> Simon. This is my partner, Simon. We've gone on many adventures together and I hope we go on many more. I love you. And uh, I could keep you guys here for like hours if I started thanking my entire family and friends. So I'm not going to do that. But here are some faces of, uh, of my family. This is only some faces. I have a huge family. Could have filled up this room. But thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to switch to Spanish for a second. Gracias a todos por estar aquí. Los amo mucho, mucho, mucho. Um, it, and thank you so much to all of my friends as well. Uh, you guys have made this, uh, this PhD such a fun journey. I mean, you live a lot of life and during your PhD. It's not, just, it's not just the work. It's all the friends and all of the fun along the way. All right, that really is a wrap. Thank you so much. Any questions from the audience? Uh, now would be a great uh, time. All right, start at the back. Yeah, so I was just curious, what are the steps ahead to go from 750 to 250 ppm? Yeah, that's a, that's a really that's a really good question. So right now I'm using a data reduction pipeline that is anything but optimal. So there's a lot of things we can do. First of all, we're not flat we're not flat fielding, and the reason for that is that there is an additive component in the flat in the flats that's coming from the baffles that I really need to spend more time understanding. So that's one thing that I'm going to spend some time this, uh, doing this summer. And the other thing is we're not uh, correcting for linearity yet uh, in the pipeline. So that's another place where we can we stand to gain uh, precision. 
The other thing is we're using AIJ, so we're using legacy software to do the photometric extraction. So this is something I've been working with uh, uh, Emily with, which is actually figuring out how we can get the best data out in terms of the photometric extraction, maybe doing a zero point magnitude calibration on every one of the, on the frames. Uh, and that's actually been paying off quite well. So we're gonna keep pushing down the front. So those are three that I think would be really interesting. Thank you, Vedant. Okay, other questions? Okay, uh, floor. Yeah, I'm just curious, so with the, uh, when you're using the laser to like align the power rays in your so do you still have to do that again every now and then, or is it just like once you do one? That's a great question. Um, this is actually something we discussed because, you know, I, uh, when, I, when I was uh, talking to the contractors to figure out uh, how we were going to redesign the secondary focusing mechanism, this is part of the work we did, uh, there was a decision to be made about whether we wanted to make that completely uh, robo uh, not robotic, but automated, so motorized, or we're, we wanted to do it mechanical. So if we would have done it automated, it would have probably made my life a lot easier in terms of collimation, but it would have meant that it would have been a lot easier for things to slip. So because the system is mechanical, it actually means that it's quite difficult for it to slip, so it's rock solid where it is at. Uh, so that's really good news, because I really don't want to do that again. <laughs> Charles, did you have a question? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. So it, it, it highly depends. So for the targets that I've observed so far, I've gotten anywhere between 10 and 100. Uh, so that's actually going back to Vedant's question. That's a huge area of improvement too. Is um, we're, we're one of the things that I want to try is trying to implement into the pipeline something like uh, the uh, sort of Honeycutt or some so there, some Honeycutt 1992 or some other algorithm where we actually become more selective about the comparison stars because we have so many right now. And frankly, I'm choosing them by hand and then, uh, um, and then uh, uh, analyzing them by hand, making sure they're not variable, but there's a lot that we can do because we have the field of view to, to pick and choose the comparison stars that we want. Chima. So, uh, yeah, you said you have a wide field of view. Is the objective still to observe one target at a time or do you ever intend to observe like multiple well, I mean, there's, uh, there's usually when I choose a target right now, I'm focusing on, on one star, but there is a reason why I can't produce light curves for every other target in the field. Um, so if we happen to be in a situation where there's more t interesting targets within the field, we can also produce easily light curves for everything else. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. The first one. Oh, this one. Yes. So this is a great one. And then also this is a, so first of all, this is a flare. Uh, this is actually not bad data. Uh, I forgot to mention that. So this is this is actually we caught a flare and you can see it more clearly. I'm about to address your question, but you can see it more clearly here. Uh, in the unfazed data. You can see we actually caught a flare. And then the data you're talking about is this. Uh, the honest answer is I don't know. So this is, the, this is kind of, uh, this is uh, systematics that I really have to go in and, and look at. So we're doing, we're doing a great job now in terms of, um, of um, filtering for bad weather. So I cannot attribute that to bad weather. It could still be the case that it was really bad. Uh, it was really bad, a, really, a, a night where there's awful seeing. Uh, because if you look at the spread of those points up here, uh, you can actually see there's quite a bit of points up here. So I have to take a closer look. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, Thanks. I'm curious, because uh, you said there were a lot of parts that you had to go to a contractor uh, to get it done. Like, how did you decide between what to delegate and what to uh, take on yourself as responsible? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so I think um, it's I think it's very case dependent. So I would say, for example, with the with the refurbishment of the telescope, it was going to be a way better time investment to spend that time actually learning, like pedagogically speaking, learning about the CCD and building and and designing the filter and building my own optical system than sitting there thinking about you know like how are we going to get these motors working. 
But what's really cool is that every, with every single contractor I worked, um, I found them to be very excited to teach me. So for example, with the, with, the, um, with the guys that we contracted to do the refurbishment for the telescope, it was not like we paid them and then let them do the work. No, then we spent uh, about a month at the, on the telescope together and they would teach me how to do every single one of the things that we had contracted them for. So. I also want to say that um, <clears throat> if you ever like, if you want to buy a new car, um, <laughs> negotiate, uh, um, renegotiate your house mortgage, uh, <laughs> I've never seen someone negotiate better than who The <laughs> Prices just fell. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Well, I'm, I'm very excited. This is not in your thesis, but I, I, one thing I did want to mention oh is that um, uh, the first science paper that Tierra data will be part of is a very exciting uh, result that um, a very beautiful data from Tierra, uh, part of a larger collaboration that was just submitted to Nature. Uh, and so um, uh, on a very interesting planetary system. Um, so we're very excited to see all the new uh, science results that we're going to be pursuing over the next uh, many years. So. OK, well, uh, of course, this is not the end. This was the public portion of the defense. Um, and so uh, Juliana will um, uh, have a closed defense starting at 2, and then we hope to report back sometime a little before 4 p.m. But for the moment, let's please thank you for a great talk.